Welcome to today's lecture where we're going to be looking at chapter 23 of the nervous system. So getting started with the basics, when we talk about the nervous system, we're talking about both the brain and spinal cord and all the nerves that come uh, out from that central portion. Uh, along with those, we have the sense organs like our uh, tongues, nose, ears, eyes. So our ability to smell, taste, hear, see, and uh, feel. And the way the nervous system is going to communicate, which we saw in the muscular system, is going to be through these chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. So neuro for nervous system and transmitters are going to be the chemicals that are uh, communicating with the other either parts of the body or other neurons to transmit signals. So then looking at the basic physiology, there's going to be basically two major components and then the brain is going to be responsible for uh, figuring out what to do with them. So the first one we're going to look at is sensory input. So when we talked about those five senses of the body, uh, there's going to be specialized neurons all over that are going to uh, respond to the stimuli from within the environment. So as that stimuli uh, activates those nerves, we're going to send a signal up the spinal cord and into the brain. And once that information gets to the brain, uh, the brain's going to interpret what those signals uh, could possibly mean. So within that brain and spinal cord, we're going to interpret that sensory information. And this is what we're going to kind of call perception. So what are we going to do now that we have this information? And the brain's going to be the ultimate uh, generator of our experience. Uh, this information doesn't mean anything until it really gets to the brain and the brain decides uh, how to respond. And it's within that response that we're going to call motor output. So we saw this with the muscular system where we move our skeletal muscles, and that could be one response that's generated. But motor output can also have to do with uh, what the glands or other organs of the body do as well. So basically, uh, the motor output does everything that the body uh, demands of it. And then on top of these uh, initial three, when we usually think about the brain, especially with humans or higher order uh, animals, we're talking about higher mental functioning. So when we say cognition, that's basically our ability to think, plan ahead, uh, see things in the future, um, our memory and our emotional response. So there's going to be specific areas of the brain in which these processes occur. And the, these areas of the brain are only going to be available in certain species where lower order animals, uh, their higher mental functioning is going to be diminished compared to something like a primates or humans. So when we break the nervous system down then into different regions, we're going to have both a central and a peripheral. So when we talk about the central nervous system, we're talking about the areas of the nervous system located in the center of the body. So the brain here and then the spinal cord going all the way down the media aspect of the body. So when we say the central nervous system, we're talking about the brain and spinal cord, brain and spinal cord only. And because it's so important, if anything were to happen to the central nervous system, uh, there'd be severe diminishing function. So we're going to surround it by protective bony structures like the skull or the uh, vertebral column. Again, the more we can protect it, the better, because there is going to be other differences between the central and peripheral nervous system. And one of the major ones that we'll see with some pathologies is when the central nervous system is damaged, it doesn't have the ability to repair itself like a peripheral nerve does. So when you see people with spinal cord injuries, uh, you generally don't see a lot of um, recovery because the central nervous system doesn't have the capability to repair itself like other nerves of the body. Uh, this is slowly changing as the research progresses, but the general rule, especially back in the day, was any injury to the central nervous system is going to uh, be uh, pretty absolute and uh, doesn't heal very well. So here we can see just the posterior aspect of the central nervous system. And then going along with the central, all the nerves that come out from that central spinal cord and brain, we're going to term uh, the peripheral nervous system. Again, peripheral meaning out to the side. Your peripheral vision is what you see out to the side. Same thing with our nervous system. So everything that all the nerves emerging from that central nervous system will consider peripheral. So they can either come directly out from the brain, which we'll call cranial nerves, or they're going to come out from the uh, spinal column as well. So all these uh, white fibers you see here are going to be what we consider the peripheral. And it's within this peripheral nervous system that we can divide it up even into smaller uh, subdivisions, uh, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So let's take a look at both of those. So if you remember when I said whenever you see the term somatic, soma is going to mean body. So we're going to be talking about what's going on. So in this case, 
Uh, so the somatic nervous system is responsible for transmitting signals to the skeletal muscles. So when we looked at that neuromuscular junction, we were talking about uh, the somatic nervous system. And the key thing I want you to know about this is that it's going to be mostly voluntary. So when we choose to move our body or contract our skeletal muscles, when we say it's voluntary, it means that we have conscious control over what actions we perform. So uh, the exception is going to be with those reflexes, like when we saw that patellar reflex, you hit the tendon with the hammer and you automatically kick. We didn't have to think about kicking, so the reflexes are going to be um, the exception to that rule of the somatic nervous system. So as a, opposing the somatic nervous system, we're going to have an involuntary part of the peripheral nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And again, this is easy to remember because you can just think it's like an automatic part of the nervous system. And this is going to be important for organs or parts of the body that we don't want to have to always consciously think about controlling. So all their organs, like our hearts and lungs, we don't have to think about every time they beat or every time we breathe in. Uh, so the autonomic nervous system is going to control those functions for us. So we're going to consider the parts of the ANS mostly involuntary, with the exception being breathing. I can make myself breathe in and out voluntarily if I want to. But if, say, I were to hold my breath and um, not taking any oxygen anymore, the brain's going to take over, make me pass out. And then once you pass out from holding your breath, the brain's going to take over and start breathing again for you. So it's kind of a little fail safe to make sure you don't do anything too stupid. And here in this picture, you can kind of see some of the parts of the um, autonomic nervous system if we zoom in a little bit. Here you can see all these white fibers that are going around are going to be part of the autonomic nervous system. So you can see how they're wrapping around all the organs of the body, uh, the heart, liver, stomach, uh, general areas, all part of the autonomic nervous system. And then we're going to break the autonomic nervous system down into two more subdivisions, uh, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And these are going to be very important for our massage therapy because our job as massage therapists is to try to get the body to calm down. And it's going to be the autonomic nervous system that's responsible for our stress states. So we're going to first look at the fight or flight system known as the sympathetic nervous system. And this is going to control our energy expenditure. So usually you think of this as our stress response. But what it really does, it's going to uh, prime the body to get ready to uh, expend energy to try to either run for its life or fight for its life. So the stress hormones like adrenaline or noradrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be a major component of the sympathetic nervous system. And we're going to look at this much more closely when we talk about the endocrine system next chapter. So I think a good example of this fight or flight response that I see uh, every month for the, probably the rest of my life is going to be the dreaded words, emblex. I've seen this create more stress uh, in my students than any other thing so far. I guess it's terrifying, the terrible emblex. And then counter to the sympathetic nervous system, we're going to have uh, the part of the ANS that uh, we call the parasympathetic. And opposed to fight or flight, it's going to be the rest and digest. So. If the sympathetic nervous system was responsible for energy expenditure, the parasympathetic is going to be responsible for building those stores of energy back up. So it's going to control our energy conservation. And as massage therapists, this is the part of the nervous system we're trying to engage. We're trying to get the body to relax. And I know you guys haven't had a lot of experience massaging each other too much, but it's very common to hear, say, someone's stomach rumble during the middle of a massage. And that's a good sign as a massage therapist because that lets you know that the body has engaged that parasympathetic system and they're um, now digesting and building back up their energy reserves. So that's where you want your clients to be. And it's very easy to do. So then taking a look at what the point of the autonomic nervous system is, if we look at the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic branch first, we can see there's going to be a whole host of... Uh, things that it's going to do to the body. So starting at the top, uh, the pupils will constrict. Uh, you, because it has to do with digestion, you're going to see the whole digestive system start to be engaged. So that's going to be an increase in saliva production. Uh, your heart rate is going to reduce and relax. Uh, your uh, blood, your uh, bronchi and the respiratory system are going to constrict. And your whole digestive system is going to be stimulated. So 
digestive organ activity goes up, pancreas, liver, uh, gallbladders are stimulated, uh, bladder is going to constrict, and uh, you can uh, get stimulation of the genital area, so stimulation or erection of the uh, genitals in a man or woman. And as massage therapists, uh, it is possible for someone to become aroused on your table. And it's important to realize it's not always uh, an overt sexual thing. It could just be uh, part of the parasympathetic response. So if that does happen, um, you just have to kind of ignore it um, unless there's other signs otherwise. But it is a possibility that it's just a response of the nervous system that they're uh, relaxed. Looking at the sympathetic nervous system then, or the fight or flight, uh, we're going to have the opposing actions. So this is going to help explain uh, the stress response that we sometimes see in people. So the pupils are going to dilate. And when you think of fight or flight, you're thinking of that um, gazelle trying to escape the lion on the Serengeti. Uh, what's their body have to do to try to get them to survive? So when we say their pupils dilate, the larger your pupil is, the more uh, light information you can take in. So the more acute your vision is going to be. So you want your pupils to dilate so you're more aware of your surroundings to be able to spot that lion. Uh, because um, digestion has nothing to do with survival in the moment, we're going to shut that entire system down. So your mouth's going to get dry and you're not going to be able to uh, swallow as easy. Uh, your lungs and respiratory system, the bronchi are going to dilate. So your body's preparing to expend a lot of energy and that means you're going to have to run long and for uh, very fast. So if your bronchi dilate, that means more oxygen and more air is going to be able to enter your system and that's going to help the uh, fuel your muscles to escape. Uh, same thing with uh, your heart rate is going to rise. So you're going to be able to better pump that oxygenated blood to the muscles to uh, use them. And again, all the digestive systems will uh, shut down. Uh, it's going to stimulate the, adre the adrenal glands to release those stress hormones to keep this system going. Uh, and somewhat stereotypically, uh, your urinary bladder is going to relax. And uh, this means the sphincter, uh, you could just uh, end up peeing on yourself. So you see this a lot with animals. Uh, if you scare them, they're just going to uh, like either pee in your hand or just pee right there. So this is the same thing that's going to happen with humans. Uh, if you stimulate that fight or flight stress response, you're going to have an initial urge to uh, go to the bathroom, whether that's urinate or defecate. Uh, so sometimes when I give out really uh, serious tests, you'll see some people go to the bathroom right beforehand. And that's because their autonomic nervous systems kicked in and they're extra nervous about the test. Taking a little bit closer look at the brain then, uh, it's going to weigh roughly around three pounds, uh, three pounds in an adult, but it's going to have very high energy demands. So even though it's only three pounds, which is about um, on average 2% of the adult body weight, it's going to use up to 20% of the body's energy. So it's very high uh, demand because it's constantly functioning, whether we're awake or sleeping, the neurons within the brain are constantly working. And all that, uh, all those action potentials, all that firing, uh, it's going to take ATP. So it's going to need a lot of energy to uh, function properly. And because it's important, we're going to surround it by a blood-brain barrier. And what a blood-brain barrier is, it's a semi-permeal membrane that's going to keep out many uh, chemicals and uh, pathogens. So the worst thing that could happen would be is if we got a bacteria or a virus within the central nervous system. Um, it would easily disrupt the functioning of the uh, nervous system. That would not be good for survival. So to kind of add an extra layer of protection, we put this blood-brain barrier. So we can see the blood on the outside here, brain on the inside here. And there's this extra barrier that's going to help filter um, all the kind of solutes within the blood to prevent them from either coming in or to double-check them to make sure they're allowed in. And this is going to be important uh, and why it's so hard to treat certain diseases of the central nervous system because a lot of the drugs that work in other parts of the bodies, um, the molecules are going to be too large or not just right enough to fit uh, to get through this blood-brain barrier. So there's kind of like a privileged site in the brain that a lot of drugs can't get into. So that's part of the reason why drug discovery with neuroscience uh, can be difficult, is getting drugs that can pass through this blood-brain barrier. Looking at the different regions of the brain, then there's going to be four major ones that I expect you guys to know for the test. So we're going to start with the outermost part called the cerebrum. And this is the largest, most superior portion of the brain. And when we talked about that higher mental functioning, this is what's going to all occur in that cerebrum. So typically when you see the brain like here, uh, all these folds and uh, crevices and uh, 
uh, ridges that stick out. This is the cerebrum that we're looking at. In particular, it's the cerebral cortex. If you remember, cortex means uh, the part of an organ that's on the outside. So the cerebral cortex is a thin gray layer covering the outside of the cerebrum. And you're going to constantly see uh, the reference to gray matter and white matter. So when we talk about gray matter, we're talking about uh, the cell body. So here we can see uh, this gray matter on the outside of the cortex there. And then opposing the gray matter is our white matter. Here you can see in white. And anytime you see white in the nervous system, it means that we're looking at the axons. In particular, these are going to be axons that have a special fatty covering to them. So in the case uh, of this nervous system, anytime you see white, we're talking about fatty tissue called myelin. And that's going to help transmit signals uh, at a better, a faster pace. And you also notice that there's this thick line going down the center of the brain, and this is called the corpus callosum. And this is what's going to connect both the right and left hemispheres of the brain. A lot of times you'll see different things about uh, hemispheres uh, having different functions one way or the other. Uh, there's some truth to them. We'll go over just the kind of uh, more accepted ones, but in general, a lot of the popular science stuff you see about left and right hemispheres isn't so much uh, based in uh, or grounded in uh, well-known science. But here we can kind of take a closer look at the corpus callosum. Uh, this is from an image called Defense uh, Diffuse Tensor Imaging, and this is looking at those white matter tracks. So you can see all this white matter, or all these axons, and it's these axons that are going to go from left to right hemispheres, and that allows the two hemispheres of the brains to uh, communicate with each other. Uh, when we finally meet back up, I'm, one of my favorite experiments to talk about, and I'll show you guys some videos, is of these split brain patients where because they had terrible seizures, we didn't really have a treatment for them, uh, especially back in the day. So one of them was to sever the corpus callosum. And uh, what this does is it stops the transmissions of those uh, signals that are causing the seizures, but at the same time, they, these patients now can't uh, communicate uh, the two sides of their brain. And uh, it's basically like having two functional different brains uh, in the same person. So uh, kind of on the surface, you don't always notice something different, but certain tests are going to really point out uh, uh, what happens when the two parts of the brains can't communicate. In some cases, their right and left hands uh, don't want to cooperate, and this is, leads to something called alien hand syndrome, where, say, one hand is trying to button someone's shirt, and the other one's going to be unbuttoning at the same time, and this person's not going to have any control over that. Uh, and we'll kind of look more into uh, what that means overall. So when we say the left hemisphere, um, if you take anything away from the left hemisphere, it's that it's going to be responsible for language. Um, so our ability to understand or to communicate is going to be based in certain areas of the left hemisphere. So that's both receiving and expressing language. Um, as far And also know that the way that the brain works is it's going to control the contralateral side of the body. So the left hemisphere is in charge of controlling signals to the right side of the body. So when I raise my right hand, it's a signal from the left side of my hemisphere, the left motor cortex. I, so then if I raise my left hand, that's a signal sent from my right hemisphere. Uh, and the only thing I'm really comfortable saying about the right is that it's involved in spatial relationships. So your ability to kind of um, either read a map or navigate a three-dimensional environment seems to be located more in the right hemisphere. And there's some other things associated between the right and left, but that's not really important for our uh, class. So then looking at the different parts of the cerebrum, we're going to be divided into lobes. And you'll notice just looking at this picture here, they're going to be named uh, after the parts of the skull in which they're found. So when we talk about the frontal lobe uh, found beneath that frontal bone of the cranium, this is going to be responsible for the cognition, so our ability to reason and plan, um, and our voluntary motor output. So the motor cortex is going to be around here. And when we talk about the ability to reason and plan, uh, this is the, basically the frontal lobe is going to be the, the last part of the brain that kind of comes online. So when they say that people uh, don't really mature until, say, the age of 25, what they're saying is that their frontal lobe hasn't fully formed all the connections yet. So this is why you see in uh, young kids or teenagers, 
their ability to kind of think ahead and plan for the future and um, not do something irresponsible, a lot of that is going to be because their frontal lobes haven't fully developed and they just haven't really thought through everything. Where someone, say, over the age of 25, their ability to reason and plan um, is more developed. This is why also you see people with brain damage. Uh, they kind of lose their impulse control is what they'll call it. The parietal lobe then, uh, you can think of sensory input. Sensory input is going to go all over the place, but when we say sensory input, this is where you'll find that somatosensory cortex that we just learned about right in here. The temporal lobe then has to do with hearing and language. Uh, you can think of this because the temporal bone is right next to the ear. This is where our auditory uh, signals are going to come from. So think hearing and language and sensory in the temporal lobe. And lastly, the occipital lobe behind the occipital bone. This is where all our visual information is going to go. So our eyes are up here in the front of the body, but there's going to be nerves that run all the way back to this occipital lobe. Uh, and it's going to be a rather large lobe. Uh, humans are very visual creatures, as with most animals with eyes. So we're going to develop, uh, devote a lot of brain real estate to our ability to see uh, well. Moving on then to the second part of the brain, it's going to be called the diencephalon, and this is going to be located deep in the center of the brain. So everything above this is going to be the cerebrum. Here then we have our diencephalon. And when we talk about the diencephalon, there's going to be certain structures associated with it. Uh, for instance, the thalamus. This is where all sensory information originally goes. So as the information comes up through that spinal cord, it's going to find its way into the thalamus. And then it's going to be the thalamus's job to direct it to certain parts of the body, depending on what that sensory information is trying to uh, communicate. So say if someone touches you on the shoulder, not only is it going to go to the somosensory cortex, it's also going to go to the emotional centers of the brain. Uh, for instance, you know, is it your parents touching you on the shoulder to give you congratulations and you feel good emotion? Is it a stranger grabbing your shoulder and you get scared? So this is how the body de uh, determines, you know, when you touch a shoulder, it's the same uh, sensory fibers are going to fire no matter what um, is happening, whether it's, uh, it's a, no matter what's happening. And it's going to be the brain that determines from all the other cues around you, like the social cues, the environmental cues, and that's how you determine what kind of uh, sensory information or what kind of response you should uh, develop. It's also going to regulate consciousness, sleep, and alertness. So some other kind of more basic functionings. Along with the thalamus then, we have the hypothalamus. And this is what's going to regulate that autonomic nervous system. So the hypothalamus is very important, uh, controlling all the uh, organs of the body. So that's going to include things uh, along with the circadian rhythm, so when we wake up and fall asleep, as well as your hunger, thirst, and body temperature. Uh, we'll take a closer look at the hypothalamus when we uh, talk about the endocrine system then. And just to kind of flesh everything out, we also have the pituitary, which is going to work very closely with the hypothalamus, and it's the pituitary's job to produce hormones. So we're going to call the pituitary the master gland. Again, we'll look at that more with the endocrine system. And lastly, we have the pineal gland that's going to produce melatonin. Uh, melatonin is going to be the hormone that helps uh, regulate uh, your sleep. Third part of the brain is going to be the cerebellum. Uh, it's the second largest part of the brain, and it's found at the base of the posterior part of the skull. So beneath that occipital lobe, we have this large cerebellum. And frankly, uh, we're still learning a lot about the cerebellum. In general, it's going to coordinate complex muscular movements, things like balance and posture. Um, if you mess up your cerebellum, you're not going to be able to kind of move easily. But there's going to be a whole lot more that goes on there. There's a lot of very densely connected neurons within the cerebellum. Um, I forget the exact total, but it makes the it competes very closely with the amount of neurons in the rest of the brain. So we're still not exactly sure what's going on uh, totally in the cerebellum. But for you guys, think it has to do with balance and posture. So cerebellum, I like to think like ballerina bellum. And then lastly, we have the brain stem. So the brain stem is going to be continuous with the spinal cord. So this is going to act as like the connection between the spinal cord with the rest of the brain. Uh, so when I ask about the spinal cord, what I want you guys to know is just be able to recognize the different parts that are within it. So that's going to include the midbrain, pons, and then everyone's heard about the medulla oblongata. 
So these are just all parts of this uh, brain stem. And what the brain stem's uh, important function is, it's going to be for vital life function. So it's going to help control your heart rate, your breathing, sleeping, and eating. So if you ever had any damage to the brain stem, you're looking at a very life-threatening uh, situation. Whereas if you damage the cerebrum or other parts up here, you'll have uh, some fear deficits in certain specific uh, mental functions, but you might not um, die from them. Whereas if you have any damage to the brain stem, you're looking at very uh, serious issues. That's about as much as the book gets into, but I do think there are some other areas of the brain that are um, rather important. Um, there's really no limit to the amount of interesting things in the brain. But a couple of them that you'll see uh, within other readings probably that you might not be introduced to in the textbook. Uh, one's going to be, well, in general, it's going to be called the limbic system. And parts of the limbic system that you see a lot are the hippocampus. And what's important about the hippocampus is this is the area of the brain that's responsible for uh, creating long-term memories. So you're going to have an experience. Uh, that experience is going to be encoded within your uh, neurons and sent to the hippocampus, where the hippocampus is going to store them away uh, to reference for future use. Uh, we still Now, it's important to distinguish the hippocampus creates long-term memories, but the memories aren't stored in the hippocampus. We actually don't know where long-term memories are stored. Uh, if we had to guess, it's just going to be completely diffuse around the entire brain, it seems. Um, so it's still uh, kind of an enigma of where all these memories are stored within the brain. Uh, along with the hippocampus in the limbic system is the amygdala. Uh, and generally, when you read about the amygdala, they're probably talking about your fear response, but it's going to be a lot more than fear. It has to more do with uh, emotional arousal. So um, in this case, just know amygdala has to do with emotions. Uh, there's going to be certain patients that, uh, for various reasons, their amygdala no longer functions. Sometimes it can calcify, uh, so it'll turn to stone and not work or they'll have it surgically taken out for a specific region. And uh, a lot of these patients, one of the uh, kind of classic signs is that they no longer have a fear response. So for instance, a lady with her amygdala taken out, she was constantly being conned by con men because she didn't have that kind of internal sense that something wasn't right. So then just like with every other part of the body, there's going to be connective tissue associated with it. So when we talk about the connective tissue of the central nervous system, we're going to term that the meninges. So the meninges of the central nervous system is the connective tissue that covers and surrounds uh, the brain and spinal cord. And what you need to know about the meninges is there's going to be three distinct layers of it. So we're going to start at the innermost and work out. So the inner layer is called the pia mater. And this is going to be very thin and delicate. So here we can see our brain. And just covering that brain is our pia mater. Above the pia mater, then, we have the arachnoid mater. So this is our middle layer. Uh, you know, arach or arachnoid is going to be uh, what we call or term spider. So it resembles a spider web. And within this uh, subarachnoid space, there's going to be a special fluid that we'll look at next that's going to help protect the brain. And then on the outermost layer of the meninges is the dura mater. And this is going to be very thick and dense. So anytime we talk about connective tissue, generally what's on the outer side of an organ is going to be the thickest. And that's because it serves as a protective function. So you want to have the protective layer on the very outside. So that fluid I was talking about that helps protect the brain, it's going to be called cerebral spinal fluid. So cerebral, we're talking about the brain. Spinal, we're talking about the spinal cord. So you'll find this CSF within the central nervous system. And it's going to be a clear fluid within the ventricles that flows around that subarachnoid space. So when we say ventricles, if you ever look at an MRI or any type of like brain scan or an actual brain, there's going to be these hollow, dark areas in the center. And this is going to be uh, where we store the, cent the cerebral spinal fluid within these ventricles. And there's about 100 to 150 milliliters, so a fair amount. And it's going to surround everything. And there's going to be three functions that I want you to know with CSF. So one, it's going to supply nutrients to the central nervous system. So because it's so metabolically active, we're going to have to support all that uh, cellular work with some nutrients. Uh, it's also going to remove the metabolic waste. Again, anytime those cells are doing something, they're going to generate waste. So it helps take that away. And it's going to act as a shock absorber as well. So if you kind of soak the entire brain 
in this pool of uh, liquid, when you kind of shake your head back and forth, it's not just going to bang against hard bone. It's going to slosh within this fluid to help kind of mediate the forces as you kind of uh, whip your uh, head around. So it's a good shock absorber. Uh, if you ever get a spinal tap, this is what they're going to put a needle within the central nervous system. So in the spinal canal, they're going to take a sample of that cerebral spinal fluid out. and uh, They'll make sure that there's no pathogens or anything within it. So then moving down from the brain to the spinal cord, you can simply think of the spinal cord as just a bundle of nerves extending from the brain stem. So it's going to exit the skull. If you remember that large hole at the base of the skull, it's called the foramen magnum. And then the spinal cord is going to go all the way down to about L2 right here. So it ends at L2, but then it's going to have a bundle of nerves that extend further down to the limbs. So simply, the spinal nerve is going to be known as like an information highway. So it's what connects the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. So all those peripheral nerves from the extremities in the trunk are going to go to this, uh, through their spinal uh, nerves up to the spinal cord into the brain. So what you need to know is that there's going to be 31 pairs of spinal nerves that stem from the spinal cord. So you, you have 31 from starting from C1 all the way down to the bundle uh, near the sacrum. And when I talk about that bundle at the base of the spinal cord, uh, this is going to be called the cauda equina. So equina, this is going to translate to horsetail. So the uh, bundle of nerves that kind of fan out is going to look like a horse's tail if you looked at them in isolation. And that's going to be uh, from L2 to L5. Zooming in at the spinal cord then, you'll recognize this again from the muscular system. We can kind of divide um, how the peripheral nervous system enters and exits the spinal cord. So when we look at the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, um, this is going to be responsible for the sensory input. So those spindle cells, Golgi tendon organs that we looked at, they're going to go through the dorsal part of the uh, spinal cord. Um, and so we call this the sensory part. And what you need to know is sometimes they're going to use the term afferent or an afferent neuron to signify that it's sensory. So afferent means that it's going to somewhere. In this case, it's going from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. So the opposite of an afferent neuron then is going to be an efferent neuron. Why they had to pick such similar sounding words uh, is just too bad. But when we talk about efferent neurons, we're talking about those motor neurons. So these are going to be exiting the ventral or the anterior aspect of the nervous system and leaving to go out to the skeletal muscles. So efferent means that you're going away from something. In this case, we're going away from the central nervous system out to the peripheral nervous system. So then just to help, again, this is going to be the front of the spinal cord here. This is the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. So ventral root, dorsal root. So the best way to kind of remember which one's sensory and which one's motor is to think of the word same. So S-A-M-E, the S and the A stand for sensory afferent, where the second half of the word me and E stands for motor and efferent. So uh, it'll be easy to mix this up because the MBLEX might, instead of saying this sensory nerve or this sensory neuron, those might say this afferent neuron. And they're just going to want you to know that they're talking about sensory and, and not motor. A couple other terms that you'll see, uh, the word ganglion, uh, you don't see this too much. I'd be surprised if you see this on any uh, MBLEX question. But ganglion is just going to mean a cluster of cells. So all these uh, nerves that run out from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, uh, they're going to be mostly axons. So the nerve at the tip of your toe is going to be a long axon that goes all the way up to basically the spinal cord. But like every cell, we need a cell body. So all the cell bodies to these neurons are going to exist in this dorsal root ganglion. And that just means a cluster of cell bodies uh, for all those axons that go into the extremity from this nerve root. So all the cell bodies are going to exist in this certain area right before the spinal cord. So for the sensory ones, we call this the DRG, or the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, there'll also be a ventral root uh, ganglion somewhere. Uh, rami, uh, we saw rami or ramus when we looked at the parts of the bones or the pelvis in particular. But a ramus, again, you're thinking of a branch of a tree or branching. So a rami in the nervous system is branches of nerve roots. So here we have our uh, 
ventral nerve root and different parts of the ventral that stick out then are going to be called different rami. Don't worry about the specific names. It's just parts of the nerve root that go somewhere else. And then lastly, we have what we call a nerve plexus. And a nerve plexus is going to be a network of closely intersecting spinal nerves. So in some areas of the body, we're going to have to kind of smush some nerves close together to get them to go all to the same area. So you'll see this. Uh, there's four plexus that it, you, uh, it'll be good to know about. So the first one is a cervical plexus, and that's going to be from C1 to C5. Next, further down from C6 to T1, we have the brachial plexus. Brachial plexus we'll talk about more when we do medical massage. Uh, this is going to be a large group of nerves. If you just let me zoom in here for a second. Here we can see this large group of nerves in the brachial plexus. Oop, still figuring this thing out. So these nerves then are all going to be what innervate uh, through the shoulder down to the arm. So they innervate the entire arm. And what can happen sometimes is they'll pass underneath certain muscles or certain other structures of the anatomy. And if they become impinged or irritated, uh, you'll end up with uh, certain neurological symptoms or neuropathy. Uh, in the case, you might get numbness in the hands or pain in the uh, shoulder or thoracic region. And that's going to be called, uh, part of what we call thoracic outlet syndrome. And there's going to be certain massage techniques that can help treat somebody that's suffering from a uh, uh, thoracic outlet. Looking down then, we have our lumbar plexus. So that's going to be L1 to L5 and the sacral plexus. A lot of times you might just see this called the lumbar sacral plexus, but overall there's four total. Zoom out. So again, the four plexus are going to be cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral and all it means is a bunch of nerves close together here uh, we're going to be talking about our dermatomes and myotomes and we've already introduced dermatomes when we talked about shingles or uh, certain uh, touch receptors and when we say dermatome this is going to be the specific area of the body that those sensory spinal nerves innervate so like we said um, each of those 31 pairs of spinal uh, roots spinal nerves are going to uh, be responsible for a specific area of the body. So uh, sciatica is a common uh, pathology that we're going to see. And sciatica is generally going to be caused by irritation uh, of those lower lumbar roots. So say if you uh, have a herniated disc at L5-S1, the L5 nerve root is going to be irritated. And there's going to be a rather uh, general region that that L5 nerve uh, uh, send signals to. So anywhere where you see this dark yellow, so L5 is going to be uh, sensing signals from uh, the anterior part of the shin, as well as the outside portion and the posterior part of the uh, thigh. This isn't really a great picture to show you the all the areas that L5 does. But the idea is that um, basically if you had tingling in the hands and the arm, you know it wouldn't be caused by a herniated disc in the low back. Those nerve roots simply don't communicate with that part of the body. So it helps you kind of uh, narrow down where the issue may be. So it can be used as a diagnostic criteria for uh, doctors looking at these conditions. And then with, uh, along with dermatomes, there's also a uh, myotome. And this is going to be groups of skeletal muscles supplied by a specific motor uh, ner neuron or nerve. You generally don't see a lot about myotomes. Uh, I rarely read anything about it. Dermatomes is going to be the one that you're going to get a question about. Because when we talk about pain or chronic pain, uh, if it's caused by a nerve issue, it's generally going to be found within a specific dermatome. And that's going to be uh, helpful to know about. You wouldn't have to know this entire map. But if you were able to reference this, depending on what your client is telling you, uh, it could serve you to help you better understand uh, what, what possibly be going on. And again, you wouldn't diagnose them saying, oh, you have a herniated disc here because of that. Uh, we don't know that information. But uh, bearing uh, any uh, limited information, you could kind of keep that in the back of your mind as far as uh, how you would uh, go about with treatment protocols. Next, we have what we call cranial nerves. And what's special about cranial nerves is that they emerge directly from the brain. And what that means is that they're going to bypass the entire spinal cord. So there's going to be 12 pairs in total. Uh, and they're, 
because they come out from the brain, it means they're going to be responsible for areas around the brain. And that's going to include the head, face, and uh, one nerve in particular goes all the way down through the chest. And they can be either sensory, motor, or both. Um, I don't use the term, but if it does both sensory and motor, they're just going to be simply called a mixed nerve. I've seen that question on ABMP. So a mixed nerve just means that there's both a sensory and a motor uh, neuron within it. Uh, I'm not real big on caring uh, a lot about cranial nerves. Uh, it's kind of like an initiation into Anatomy 101 that you memorize all the cranial nerves and what they do. I'm not really sure that uh, all the effort that goes into memorizing these cranial nerves is going to pay off. At most, you'll probably get one question on MBLEX about them, if any. So I'll introduce them. I'll ask a couple questions about the more important ones. It's going to be important that you know that there's 12 of them and that you can at least uh, name all 12 and uh, which correct number that they are. Whether or not you know they're sensory or what they're responsible for, that's going to be extra information where if you basically know everything else about anatomy and you want to still study more, uh, go ahead and study more of the cranial nerves. But I'm not going to really hammer down on making sure you guys know every piece of information about them. And a lot of times you can use their name as kind of a clue of what they're responsible for. So for instance, cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. And if you don't already know, we're going to learn soon. That olfaction is just the fancy term for smell. So the olfactory nerve is the sensory nerve that has to do with smell. And again, you know it's sensory because of those five senses we talk about, smell is going to be one of them. An optic nerve has to do with uh, vision. Again, you can pretty much guess when you see the term, the prefix optic, you're thinking eye and vision. So cranial nerve number three is ocular motor. And then ocular, again, you're thinking eye and motor is right in the term, so you know this is a motor neuron. So this is going to help uh, the visual system help, I believe, the eyes move. Even I don't know exactly what they do. Trochlear, again, tro uh, cranial nerve number four is trochlear. And it's a motor neuron that has to do, motor nerve that has to do with uh, eyes again. Uh, because the eyes are so important, we're going to have multiple cranial nerves that are responsible for different functions. Cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal. Uh, this is part of a sensory function within the facial area. So you different uh, parts of your face, the feeling of it, as well as has some motor function for chewing muscles. Um, I might ask you about the trigeminal just because there is, um, when you have chronic, certain chronic uh, neuropathy of the face, a lot of times the trigeminal nerve is part of it. So if you get shingles, sometimes it affects the trigeminal nerve, or I believe there's suicide headaches, which are really bad headaches that have to do with irritation of the trigeminal nerve as well. So there's going to be some pain conditions that references cranial nerve number five. Cranial nerve number six is the abducens. Again, eyes are important, so there's another motor nerve for that. Cranial nerve number seven is facial. So again, this has to do with taste and some facial muscles, uh, the motor. Uh, cranial nerve number seven, when we talk about Bell's palsy, this is going to be an issue with cranial nerve number seven. And people with Bell's palsy, they're going to have a drooping of uh, one side that that nerve affects. So that's why the facial muscles are affected with Bell's palsy. Cranial nerve number eight is the vestibulo, vestibulo cochlear uh, cranial nerve. Has to do with balance and hearing. So the cochlear we're going to learn has to, is within the ear. And that's where uh, we have our sense of balance as well as our ability to hear. Cranial nerve number nine is the glossopharyngeal. If you remember way back to medical prefixes, anytime you see glosso, uh, you're thinking tongue, so in this case, it has to do with taste and swallowing. Pharyngeal is the back of the throat. Uh, cranial nerve number 10, then, is the vagus nerve. And if you're ever going to see anything as massage therapist, generally it's going to be about the vagus nerve, just because it has so many different functions, uh, because it affects so many different organs. So it's both sensory and motor, but it can affect uh, your ability to sweat, your heart rate, uh, as well as your speech and breathing. And then looking at the last two cranial nerves, we have cranial nerve number 11, the accessory nerve. And this is going to innervate uh, some of the upper back muscles like the trapezius. And with cranial nerve number 12 being the hypoglossal. Again, glossal, you're thinking tongue. So it has to do with your ability to move your tongue. So as with anything in anatomy that you have to spend a lot of time memorizing, someone's come up with a mnemonic to kind of help you remember the order in which the cranial nerves are named. So the mnemonic 
to touch and feel very groovy virgins at home. And as with any good mnemonic, uh, it's going to be a little bit perverted because one thing about our brains is uh, it's much better remembering things that are kind of uh, emotionally arousing or just emotionally memorable. So hence the kind of uh, weird mnemonics that I kind of introduced to you guys. But the idea is if you can remember this simple sentence, uh, you can remember the order of the cranial nerve. So if you were getting a question like, uh, what's this fifth cranial nerve has to do with uh, the face? You can see one, two, three, four, five. You know the fifth one has to do, uh, it's going to at least begin with a T. And with a multiple choice question, there's only two cranial nerves that begin with T. So now you have a 50 50 chance instead of just a complete random guess. So that's why it's important to remember some kind of mnemonic just so you can remember the first letters of each of those cranial nerves. Moving on to reflexes then, we already talked about reflexes when we talked about those proprioceptors, but again, a reflex is going to be an involuntary and predictable uh, protective response to a stimuli. So that can either be a muscle contraction like we saw, or even a glandular secretion. So there's going to be two kind of major uh, types of reflexes. The first one's going to be a cranial or a visceral reflex, and because it's cranial, it's going to be initiated by the brain. So this is going to be things like blinking, uh, forming tears, salivating, or gagging. These are all cranial reflexes. So here we have a nice little picture of a nasal pharyngeal swab, uh, kind of made famous as this is the current coronavirus test. So, so far my wife's got two of these. And every time I've heard someone who's gotten this uh, swab test is your eyes immediately start to water. So that'd be an example of a cranial uh, nerve reflex. But it's kind of interesting to see this is how far back uh, those uh, nasal cavities go. And then the one we already looked at was the spinal or the somatic reflex. And this is named after because it's going to be initiated at the spinal level. So again, you have that sensory nerve going through uh, to the spinal cord, and then it's going to send a motor signal out to the muscle to cause a uh, reflex. So we looked at the quadriceps or the patellar reflex, but there's going to be multiple reflexes at all different um, parts of the body. Uh, so doctors will do uh, different ones at different joints. It's just the knee is the easiest one to do, I'm guessing, or the most uh, obvious. And if there was something wrong with either of these reflexes, it would kind of give you a clue that something's going wrong um, at that level. So we're going to briefly talk about the senses. Uh, this is going to be very brief overview. We're not going to get too much into it, just the basics. And that's going to include the different types of sensory receptors. So this is going to be straightforward, multiple choice questions, things like a chemo receptors are going to detect chemicals, and we'll just go down and look at each of these uh, in particular. Uh, photoreceptors, uh, photo, you're thinking light, the thing, uh, receptors of the eye. Thermo, we said, are going to detect temperatures. Nociceptors detect noxious stimuli. A lot of uh, sources, and I wouldn't be surprised if Emblex makes this uh, kind of uh, mistake, is they'll say nociceptors detect pain. Uh, when we talk about pain later in the course, uh, it's important to know that all the sensory information from your nociceptors, it isn't pain until the brain says it's pain. So it doesn't matter um, what's going on in the periphery. The brain's going to be the ultimate determiner uh, if something's painful or not. So like the classic example is if you just scored a touchdown uh, in the Super Bowl and your whole team jumps on top of you and celebrating, you're going to be firing these nociceptors off like crazy. But uh, you're not in a dangerous situation. Uh, your body doesn't care about any of that. So it's not going to send a signal saying that you're in extreme pain because it's thrilled that it just, you just won the Super Bowl. So again, it detects noxious stimuli, not pain stimuli. And when we say noxious, we're just talking about excessive temperature or uh, uh, potential tissue damage. And then lastly is the mechanoreceptors, which we just saw in the skin system. So those touch receptors that sense uh, pressure and vibration. So I'm looking very closely. The chemoreceptors you're going to find on your tongue, so your taste buds, as well as within the uh, nose. So chemoreceptors in your nose are going to be what sense smell. And again, that sense of smell we're going to call the olfaction. So anytime you see the word olfactory, like olfactory nerves or olfactory tract, we're talking about nerves associated with your sense of smell. Here we have hearing. Uh, so how hearing works, again, uh, sound is just going to be vibrational waves that are transmitted through the air or some sort of medium. So as those sound waves enter through our eardrum here, 
they're going to be uh, kind of channeled into the ear canal where they're going to cause this eardrum known as the tympanic membrane to vibrate. And it's this vibration of the eardrum that's going to cause these three little muscles here called ossicles. The vibrations are going to be transmitted and amplified through these three small bones. And this uh, last bone here is going to kind of hit on this uh, cochlea that's filled with a bunch of fluid. So as you pound on this cochlea, you're going to cause the fluid in this co as you pound on this cochlea, you're going to cause the fluid in here to also vibrate. And it's going to be the vibration within that fluid uh, that stimulates these special hair cells within the uh, semicircular canal. And that's going to be what stimulates the auditory nerves to transmit hearing. So it's just the propagation and kind of amplification of sound waves uh, until they finally get to the sensitive nerves deeper into the ear. Uh, as far as what you find need to know, cochlea, I've seen questions. Uh, anytime you see cochlea, know that we're talking about uh, hearing or the ear. So we just saw that with the cranial nerves. But cochlea is going to mean snail shape. So you can see this uh, kind of little organ here has that snail shape or snail shell shaped figure. When we talk about vision, um, I'm not going to ask a whole lot of questions on it, but some more common kind of anatomical terms that you'll see is the cornea is going to be this outer lens. So it's the outermost part of the eyeball. So when you hear people scratch the cornea, that's because it's the part that's exposed to the outside environment. Going inward then, we have the iris is going to be a muscle, and that's going to control how uh, dilated or constricted your pupil is. So as your pupil becomes more constricted, it's going to uh, cause it to lessen up. And when we say pupil, this is like the hole within the eyeball that allows light to pass through it. So the larger your pupil is, the more light beams can enter into the eyeball. But before it gets to the back of the eyeball, you again have this second lens here that's going to help focus light onto the back of the eyeball. And the back of the eyeball is going to be called the retina. And it's within the retina on the back of the eyeball where you'll find those photosensitive receptors. So those photoreceptors are going to be uh, very numerous on this back part of the eyeball called the retina. And then once those uh, photocells on the uh, retina are stimulated, they're going to send a signal through this optic nerve back to the occipital lobe where it'll process the visual stimuli. So what's interesting, if you kind of take a look at this picture here, you'll notice this optic nerve, because of its um, in the back of the eyeball, there's not going to be any photoreceptors in this particular area. So each eyeball has a blind spot to it. So when we next meet in class, I can give you a little experiment where you can notice your blind spot uh, in each of your eyes. So you have to close one eyeball and uh, your blind spot will become um, noticeable with certain uh, experiments. And again, here the way it all works, the light photons are going to pass through the eyeball. They're going to pass through the two lenses. And because those lenses are curved in a specific uh, shape, they're going to cause those light rays to converge and to a pinpoint area on the back of the retina. So when you get the light convergence at uh, just the right spot, you'll have very clear vision. Uh, if your lens or uh, the front of your eyeball or your eyeball is shaped oddly, and it causes uh, this reflection of light rays to not quite be perfect, that's when you're going to need certain glasses to help uh, bend those light rays. So what you should know as far as the photoreceptors, there's going to be two major types. Uh, there's going to be rods and cones. So rods are going to be more on the peripheral part of the visual system. So they're good at detecting low light. So seeing things uh, at nighttime. And again, they're more prominent in the peripheral. So uh, if you ever watch some of those survival shows, uh, if you're kind of stuck in the woods in a low light setting, what you can do is uh, kind of look out the sides of your eyes and you'll get a more clear picture of uh, what to see. Whereas cones are going to be more in the center of your visual field and they're going to detect bright lights and colors. So cones are responsible for color vision. Rods are for black and white vision. So when you have certain types of color blindness, there's going to be some cones that don't uh, function properly. And there's multiple types of color blindness. And again, I can give you guys a test to see uh, if you're colorblind or not. And then we're going to briefly look at the kind of anatomy of the nerves and the neurons themselves. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at the particulars of a nerve, but what's important to realize is when we've talked about uh, neurons so far, we've talked about a single cell and like the axons and the dendrites and what they do. But just like muscles, uh, these nerves are going to be put together and bundled together in a large compact uh, structure called, this is what we call a nerve. And it's going to be named directly or exactly the same as we name uh, muscle cells. Instead of calling it a mycelium, we're just going to call it a uh, neurium. So if we start small, we can see an individual nerve cell is a neuron, and it's surrounded by connective tissue called endoneurium. We're going to kind of group all those individual neurons together into a fascicle. So that's the same as a muscle. And it's going to be surrounded by connective tissue called perineurium. And then all these fascicles are again grouped together and bundled into a fiber that we just call a nerve. And this entire nerve is going to be surrounded by connective tissue called the epineurium. So I understand you guys already know this about how muscles are named. So as long as you remember it's neurium instead of mycelium, it's basically the exact same. So I'm not going to retest you guys on that. But the important thing is there's going to be many, many neurons in each nerve. So a large nerve, the largest nerve of the body is the sciatic nerve. There's going to be many, 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 many neurons within that sciatic nerve. And they're going to branch out into different areas, innervate different things. And this is how you can have both sensory and motor uh, neurons within the same nerve, because there's many different tracks. Here, uh, you don't need to know any of these cells in particular. All I want you to know is that uh, neurons are going to function in isolation. They're going to have a lot of support cells. So cells that support neurons are called neuroglia. Uh, glia is going to, uh, I think, Latin for glue. And they originally thought these were just cells that kind of held the neurons together. But we're really kind of discovering now that neuroglia have a lot of specialized functions that uh, can contribute to a lot of different things. So neuroglia are kind of much more important than what they were originally thought were just kind of like connective tissue. And there's going to be different types found in different areas of the nervous system. And Bleck specifically says you don't need to know anything about neuroglia, so don't worry about any of this information. That's kind of just extra stuff. Uh, when we talk about the anatomy of a neuron, we've already talked about the very basics, and that includes the dendrites and axons. So for dendrites, you should be thinking this is the part of the neuron that receives information. So here we have a bunch of dendrites on our neuron, and there's going to be connections to each of these dendrites uh, from other cells. So they're receiving information from other neurons. And then if you stimulate this cell, it's going to send a signal down the axon. So it's this axon that transmits any information. So dendrites receive, axons transmit. And then we'll look at the action potential more. Again, and Bleck says you don't need to know how action potentials work. Uh, I'll still explain it in another uh, video, uh, but I won't ask about it on the test. It'll probably just be extra credit if I do. But at the very start of the axon, there's what we call the axon hillock. And this is where an action potential either uh, decides to begin or doesn't decide to begin. So basically, if you stimulate the axon hillock, the entire axon will fire an action potential. So you can think of the hillock as kind of like the first domino in a string of dominoes. If you knock down that axon hillock, the, the rest of the neuron is going to follow along and transmit the action potential too. And to help the speed of the action potential, there's going to be that fatty substance that covers the axon, and this is called a myelin sheath. And the whole point of a myelin sheath is to speed up the conductance of that electrical signal. Uh, and we'll again in the next video look at how myelin accomplishes this. But the more myelin, the faster it can go. If there's no myelin, uh, the signal is going to be tr transmitted much more slowly. And then you'll notice that the myelin isn't one uh, complete covering. There's going to be uh, sections without any myelin, uh, inner space between the, uh, down the entire axon. And this is going to help uh, kind of re-strengthen the signal. If it was just one sheet of myelin, the signal would come, become weaker and dissipate. Uh, but in this case, we can kind of stimulate those ion channels and kind of re-strengthen the actual potential as it goes along. So these gaps in myelin sheath are called nodes of Rondier. And as far as the different types of neurons, we also saw this in the muscular system. Uh, basically three major types. Uh, we have excitatory neurons, where they're going to basically a signal from excitatory neurons is going to tell the neuron it connects to to also uh, transmit an actual potential. Whereas an inhibitory neuron is going to tell the neuron uh, it's sending a signal to to not send a signal. So I'll kind of give you guys a diagram in the next lecture of how these excitatory inhibitory neurons uh, kind of
kind of create what we call a network or a neural network of uh, signals. And then we also have inner neurons, and these are going to be much smaller neurons, and their job is to help modulate. So um, while it can be like an all or none thing with action potential, we can make these cells more or less likely to fire, and that's going to be the job of these inner neurons. And then when we look at these neural networks, we already saw these terms. When two neurons connect, we're going to call this a synapse. So a synapse is simply the connection of two neurons. And we can uh, have different names for the two neurons that connect. So the neuron that's sending the signal is called the presynaptic, so the one before the synapse. And then the one that's receiving the signal is the postsynaptic, so it's receiving the impulse. You can see here that at the end of both of these neurons, we kind of have like a growing out of the synaptic bulb or the, the tip of the neurons. So this outgrowth uh, that kind of makes it a bulb shape is simply the synaptic bulb. So it's the end of a neuron. And then as we showed, there's a small space. So there are some neurons that they have direct connections. Uh, so there's no synaptic cleft. But the majority of neurons, there's going to be this tiny space that allows for the neurotransmitters to float around. And this allows us to help modulate the strength of the signal or weaken the strength of the signal. So that, again, it's called the synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap. And we already saw the neurotransmitters is going to be that chemical messenger that's released by the neuron. So the presynaptic cell releases the neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic cell has receptors that are going to be sensitive to that neurotransmitter. Then very briefly looking at what neurotransmitters are. Uh, again, they're going to be stored in these vesicles at the tips of the presynaptic bulb. And then the action potential, what we saw, is going to cause these to dock to the uh, cell membrane and be released into the synapse. So what I want you to know about neurotransmitters, the book has a whole list of the different ones and what they are responsible for. Uh, again, NBLEX says you don't need to know all that specific, and it's not important for our case so much. Uh, but what you should know is there's two major uh, ones that are involved in excitation and in inhibitory function. So in general, uh, glutamate is the most excitatory neurotransmitter. So if we want to stimulate another neuron, uh, glutamate is by far the most common neurotransmitter that we'll use. Whereas if we want to inhibit another neuron, that neuron's going to release GABA. GABA is just um, uh, a shortening of a much more complicated word. So GABA is going to be an inhibitory neuron. Again, the book doesn't even have glutamate for some reason. I don't know how it left that one out. But these are the only two I really want you to know. Uh, the more common ones that you hear about a lot are going to be like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine. Um, these are common, but they're in much less supply than either glutamate or GABA. So you can think of these as kind of like the modulatory neurotransmitters. And the reason I don't expect you guys to really know about what they do is the, the function of a neurotransmitter it doesn't really have to do with the neurotransmitter itself. It has to do with um, the receptor on the neuron that it's receiving it. So dopamine can be either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the neuron uh, that we're talking about. And that's everything. So the next class, we're gonna go over certain pathologies. I don't like to get into neuropathology too much because a lot of the ones we don't even really understand exactly what's going on. So I'll give you a couple choice examples and I'll show you like a lot of times the pathology has to do with uh, there's something wrong within the pathway. So one of the neurons isn't working right and the signal is being messed up. So um, there's not a lot to talk about.